This is the oral history interview project through the Seymour Library and the Cayuga Museum in collaboration with the New York Heritage Site. This is Alexis Rivers interviewing Bill Berry over Zoom on July 30th, 2020. So Bill, where and when were you born? November 8th, 1949. Um, the Women's Hospital, which at the time I believe was affiliated with St. Luke's Hospital in uh, New York City. Can you tell me a little bit about your family, what your parents did for a living, if you have any siblings? I'm just going to pick it up once they started to have children. My, my dad um, was originally from New Orleans. My mom was originally from Tampa, Florida. Uh, they met when they were like young, 18. My dad was in the uh, military. But basically his job was working for what was called the Defense Contract Administration of the you know, United States government that at the time had an office located in Garden City, Long Island. Um, so so he, he, he worked to commute. At the time we were living in the Bronx, in a section of the Bronx that eventually became known as the South Bronx when the war on poverty started in the New York City housing projects, specifically Patterson projects. Um, my mom basically was an at-home mom. She, she did not work until we were much older, but her, her primary thing was just, you know, maintaining the home. There were four children. Um, I have an older sister. We're separated by 14 months. And then five years after me is um, my brother who passed away a few years ago. And then five years after him is uh, the baby of the family. Um, who's currently living in Baltimore. So, so, so right now, both of my parents are deceased. They're both interred at Arlington National Cemetery. The, the oldest daughter is out in um, California, and the youngest daughter is in Baltimore, and I'm in Auburn, New York. Can you describe any family tra uh, traditions you had growing up? Family traditions? Oh, um, that, that that's that's interesting because I think when you grow up you really don't think about traditions in in the general sense um one one, one thing I'm, i i I always remember my, my because my family my parents rather were very family centric they did not go out a lot um this is back in the day when adults tended to socialize with one another. In, in the home, you know, it, it was infrequent that you went out to a club or something like that because basically um, for after World War II, a lot of folks could not afford it. I mean, the New York City housing project started as a way of providing affordable housing for um, military men and women who were returning from World War II. So I grew up in a well-integrated, multi-ethnic, multicultural neighborhood which is totally different from where the projects are now. But going back to tradition, I mean, it, you know, the, the regular thing, the, the holiday times, Christmas, um, was always something that was celebrated. You know, you, you get the tree, you decorate the tree, gifts are under the tree. I remember growing up always being fascinated. Um, my brother and I shared a bedroom, my two sisters shared a bedroom, and my parents had their own bedroom because it was a three bedroom uh, apartment. And, and somebody tugging on me, Santa Claus has been here, Santa Claus has been here, and, and, and you get up and you know, there's all of this stuff and you don't know how it got there. As I got older and, and I was still living at home, you know, with my younger brother and younger sister, what, what then became amazing to me was the tradition of setting up all their gifts and toys while they were asleep. And it just fascinated me how parents do that to make it a, a joyful surprise in the morning. Um, but you never knew that growing up. Um, I, I don't think there were any other particular family traditions. Uh, maybe one more was because, as I was saying earlier, my parents did not go out. They would invite other adults by uh, 
to play cards, listen to music, dance. You know, you're talking about maybe three or four other couples. Um, and, you know, they would make hors d'oeuvres. And for us children, the fun part was that the next day, and, and normally this would be on a Saturday evening, so that Sunday we were able to get all the leftovers that were there. So, so my parents then created our own little family party um, because at a certain point in time, the children, you know, we had to go to bed and the adults stayed up. Uh, and, and going back to the holidays, at the time, um, my mom's uncle had a uh, men's clothing store in Harlem. And when he closed the store on Christmas Eve, he would always come by the house. So that, that was kind of special um, because it was good seeing him and we were always able to stay up later than, than what we were supposed to. But, but by and large, those are kind of the, the few things that stick in my mind as way well as any type of family tradition. You mentioned that it's a three bedroom apartment. Can you tell me anything else about the house or your neighborhood? Okay, um, the New York City housing projects, the, the, the Patterson projects were um, either six story buildings or 13 story buildings. Generally, um, the, 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 it was an elevator building, one elevator per building, except for the 13 story buildings. I think they had two elevators. But in, in where we live, we lived on the fourth floor. Um, there was a still well, there was an, an, an elevator, three apartments on one side of the building. Then you have the elevator, you would go through kind of a fire door and there were three other apartments on, on that side. Um, where we live, our other two neighbors, uh, an African-American family, a Latino family. Um, and on the fifth floor, the apartment right above us was a a white family, I believe, from kind of a, a, a German heritage thing, so that, you know, you, you, you grew up inter interspersed with other people of other cultures. The apartment, when you came through the front door, you walked into a kitchen area um, that was large enough to have, you know, the, the area where you had your refrigerator, the, the, the stove, sink, and all that. And then an area where you could set up a um, uh, an eating table, and then that would lead directly into a living room, and then the living room would lead into a hallway, where to the right, as soon as you left the, the um, living room, on the right was the bathroom, um, sink, toilet, bathtub. Because at at the time there were no showers, and in fact I remember when showers were, were beginning to be introduced in terms of the projects. Now, off of that hallway, that's where the bedrooms were. So if you think of a single line that then, then branched out three ways, straight ahead was a bedroom. That's where my brother and I um, slept. To the left was where my two sisters slept, slept and to the right was where my parents slept. Um, the rooms that give you a, a sense of the dimension, the room that I shared, two twin beds, a chest of drawer. Down the road, I put up bookshelves on the wall. Uh, in my sister's bedroom, um, full-size bed, my parents' room, full-size bed. And in fact, their first, in, in their bedroom, there was also where they had, you know, um, uh, a, I guess a high boy chest of drawers. And then uh, a, a lower one, which was my mom's two mirrors, they w had um, a combination TV, radio, record player that was in their room. In fact, I, I still have that piece of furniture in, in my house. So um, no air conditioning, um, radiator heating. Uh, and, and the interesting thing during the summer when it was hot, everybody, what you would do is prop open your front door, uh, open up your windows to try to create some level of cross ventilation so that as you moved around the building, you always saw your neighbors because nobody 
you know, the doors were closed at night when people went to bed. Otherwise, they were open and you can peek in and folks would say hi and you could say hi to them. So it was a very um, communal um, type of way of growing up where people knew one another, where you still had, you know, your mom may say, we're out of sugar, go next door, get me a cup of sugar or, you know, we're out of this, we're out of that. So you had the sense of sharing that I think is the void today because most folks don't know who their neighbors are, whether they live in a home or whether they're in some type of multi-dwelling complex. Did your family follow a particular religion? And if so, do you still follow that religion today? The interesting thing, uh, when my parents were married, my, my dad was Baptist, my mother was raised Catholic. To be able to marry her, he had to agree that the children would be raised Catholic. Um, so that's how we were raised. We went to a Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school, um, Sunday morning mass. I was an altar boy. Um, you know, baptisms, confirmations, or all those types of things that Catholics go through. No, I do not practice any form of religion now. Um, I've always had political and social justice issues with the Catholic Church and, and their position on things that I think are critically important. But yeah, I did go up in a Roman Catholic household. Um, my mom, used to talk about the racism that existed in the church because the Catholic Church then and probably is still now is heavily Irish and there was always some degree of discrimination and bias um, towards black folks and my dad was while he was not a practicing Catholic he was active you know in, in, in fun fundraising drives that would go on he made sure we went to church every Sunday um, you know from Catholic elementary school, going to Catholic high school where there was tuition, he would budget to make sure that we were able to have four years of a Catholic education. And then after that point, um, folks make decisions. I don't think anyone in my family went on to a Catholic college. In fact, as I think through it, no, nobody did. And at this point, um, one sister is probably Baptist and definitely not Catholic. The other system is more of a spiritualist that may be grounded in, in um, Scientology. Um, while I think I'm spiritual, I have no interest in belonging to any type of organized um, faith-based religious organization. What was school like for you? Um, sc elementary school, we had a Catholic church, a rectory, a convent, a Catholic school right in the neighborhood. So, and then across the street from that, there was a public school. So everybody who lived in the projects, you either went to St. Rita's or you went to PS, was it PS 18 or PS 19? I don't remember. But, but basically, uh, the schools were in the neighborhood. So again, children that you would play with, you went to school with. Um, um, after graduating from the eighth grade, I went to a um, Catholic high school, a college preparatory school. And back then to get into the more academically elite Catholic high schools, you had to take uh, a, a standardized test. Um, and I guess the, the institution I went to, Cardinal Spellman was at in, in kind of the upper echelon of uh, college prep academically orientated schools. So I graduated with a Regents High School diploma, did all the stuff that that made me eligible to um, apply to inst any institution that I wanted to, but I purposely had no interest in going to a Catholic college. So I don't remember applying to any um, Catholic colleges that were in the Bronx. I mean, Manhattan College was there, Fordham University was there, St. John's University was there. So in, in, the, in the New York City area, there were a number of uh, Catholic institutions, but by then I had no interest in uh, a Catholic higher education. Did you have any hobbies or special interests as a kid? Was there anything sort of popular in the way of music or books that you remember? Um, 
I, I was a child that grew up that enjoyed playing by myself. So, you know, I had the little, um, you know, cowboys and Indians, the little military figures. Uh, I remember I had a, um, there used to be a TV program called Howdy Duty. I had a Howdy, Howdy Duty marinette that I used to play with. Um, and, and then you had different, you know, outdoor games that children played, um, things called Ringo, Le Ringo Levio, Johnny on the Pony. Um, we kind of, uh, girls used to play, you know, hopscotch. We kind of took that over and marbles and skellies where you, you know, you had soda um, bottle caps and, you know, you had a diagram and you had to shoot these bottle caps into certain areas. Um, so, so it was just like urban based games. Hide and seek was always, you know, a big one. Um, a game called war where you had two teams and one team would go out and, and hide all over the place. And then the other team had to find them. And if you were tagged, then you went to jail and you couldn't get out of jail unless a member of your team came and tapped the bench and, 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 you know, set free. And then the game would continue until everybody was eventually um, caught. And then, you know, the, the, when I was describing the, the grammar school I went to and the public school, well, what separated them was a, was a park with basketball courts and softball fields and a sandbox and um, monkey bars and slides and that old bit. So, you know, you would utilize that park um and then typical urban stuff during the summer you know somebody got a wrench opened up a fire hydrant and that's how people cooled off because there were no pools there were no swimming pools um nobody had second homes where where they can take the family to go to so you know the fun was open up the fire hydrant people would run through get wet cars would come by you took a soda can put it over it so you can create the stream and then you would splash the cars and that whole bit. And some cars would go through slowly because they figured they can get a free car wash, but it was stuff like that. And then eventually, because of the effects on water pressure, the city decided to put sprinklers on the hydrant. So then you had kind of a more um, shower effect, but it was basically games like that, roller skating, um, stick ball sometimes um touch football um basketball the types of things that um were easily affordable who, who you know during the holidays if somebody got a basketball wall while the basketball was theirs it was like a community basketball you know and you know if you had to go home but but there was a game going on somebody would would hold your ball so you know, that type of, from football to basketballs to, to um, softball. I mean, when I was growing up, I was, was on a softball team, interestingly called the Mohawks. Um, and through the local park, there was a softball league and your team would register and play and that whole bit. So it, it was, it was kind of impromptu or organized sporting things that um, enable children to play and get to know each other. W one thing I should mention, and it was not so much a family tradition, but maybe in a, a community um, tradition. This was back in the day that um, if you were doing something that you should not be doing, any adult could chastise you and tell you to stop and you stop. This is back in the day when, when police actually walked a beat. So you had community policing. So you knew the police officer in your beat. This is back in the day where um, you have butcher shops and, and fish markets, and you could literally go to, let's say, you know, the, the butcher shop and say, my mom needs this, can she pay you later? And folks would wrap up what you need, here you go, and then write your name in a little book. And whenever you could settle, you can settle. 
I mean, so, so the overall ambiance was totally different from today because people had relationships that were of trusting, a trusting nature, which probably does not exist today. And there was a real sense that, you know, today we hear this, oh, we're all in this together. Well, that's a crock, a blank, because that's not true. But back then, people really felt that they were all in it together. And if I can lift you up and better you, I was also lifting up myself and bettering myself. So the sense of community was a real sense of community that you do not necessarily find today, even when we use this term community. You went to college. Can you describe that for me? Yeah, it, 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 interestingly, I originally thought I was going to go to Howard University because I was interested in going to a black institution. I wanted to major in pharmacy. Um, and, and Howard at the time had a school of pharmacy. You would do two years of undergraduate work, then you know, transfer into the College of Pharmacy for three years of training because I wanted to be a, a pharmacist looking at research. Um, I was waiting to hear whether or not I was going to get a, a, a full scholarship to Howard because my parents definitely could not afford it. Um, but in the meantime, I was also accepted to the City University of New York. And at the time, Hunter College had two campuses, one campus on 68th Street in Manhattan and the other one uh, up in the Bronx. So I, I decided instead of, you know, be, because that semester, at the City University started earlier than Howard. So I figured, well, you know, let, let, let me go here. I'll get a chance to meet some people. And then when it's time for me to go to Howard, I'll go to Howard to, to, to kind of abridge the story. Um, by the time I heard from Howard, I was deeply involved in um, going to classes at Hunter College in the Bronx. So I didn't take Howard up on its offer. And I figured that, you know, after two years, I would just transfer from the City University to Howard. Um, well, I found out that my ability to handle um, chemistry courses was not what it should be, so I uh, uh, abandoned the idea of being a pharmacist and, and kind of having a scientific thing. And it, it was interesting. I, I went to college in the um, mid-60s, and, and to give you a sense of, dy of the dynamics, uh, my first year in college, which was in 67, the, the, the image of being a college man, you, you wore a shirt and tie. I mean, you know, folks, folks would come to school in kind of a semi-formal attire. I remember having females who wore white gloves because that was kind of the, the, the expectation. My sophomore year, the summer of 68 changed everything. I mean, the, the, the kind of counter culture movement was flourishing in San Francisco. Hippies, Afros, bells, um, beads, um, use of drugs. So that the second year you came back and everybody who used to wear shirt and ties and suit up, you know, they come back with their South, South Korean and bell bottoms and sandals and Afros and, and, and long hair. And it was a totally different mindset because politically at the time, the country was at a level of, of, of evil. And college students found themselves having to align, um, much like today, with either kind of a liberal, progressive, radical front or conservative, you know, we want things to say the same front and at my college, most of the athletes were the kind of traditionalists and the liberal arts folks and the, 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 the fine art folks were a totally different mindset. Um, when I started my college career, there was no um, black studies department or any other type of gender or ethnic department. And by the time I left, um, we did have a black studies department. We had the beginnings of a women's studies department. In fact, a few years later, I went back to that department and taught. But, but it was a whole different dynamic. And what the city university decided was to make 
Hunter College in the Bronx, which owned four-year independent institution. So going into my junior year, the college name became Lehman College in honor of a former governor of New York State. Um, our campus was a few blocks away from the Bronx High School of Science, which at the time was the premier academically higher echelon uh, high school. And oftentimes those students would come on campus. And so in, in terms of uh, any type of political activity, you had this meshing of high school students with college students. And um, this is back in the days of Students for a Democratic Society, um, Black clubs, dashikis, Afros, that whole bit. So it, 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 it was a, a time where you became of age based on your political involvement or your cultural involvement. But there was a difference not only in terms of physical apparel, in terms of art, music, culture. I mean, you know, Woodstock, um, Altamont, all, all of these things where you, you, you start to, the, the music, the art be, becomes con, con, different culturally than what it used to be. Um, and, and it, it, you know, that's why we just call it the 60s, because it was a definable moment where the overall society was forced to transform into something that it wasn't prior to, you know, Vietnam and political convention, conventions and, and people exercising, you know, their right to vote. Um, so it was, it was a totally different mindset totally different time period. So what made you relocate to Cuyahoga County, Auburn from the city? Um, my background's in higher education. Uh, I, when I left being uh, executive assistant to the president of Rockland Community College, my president recommended me um, to the president of Cuyahoga Community College for a new deanship they were creating. Um, went through the interview process, um, was offered the position, had no, had no family, no friends, nobody of state, New York. Um, so I came primarily to become dean of institutional initiatives and strategic planning at the local community college. Um, and immediately before then, I was at Rockland Community College, and that was, you know, across then what was called the Tappan Zee Bridge is now the Cuomo Bridge. Um, and, and, and that setting was more suburban. Well, it was interesting to go from being born and raised in the Bronx, working at a number of urban institutions, to go to, you know, an institution that was more suburbanly based, and then from there to an institution that existed in a more rural, small rural community. So that, that's what prompted me to um, come here. And then when, you know, I came to Cuyahoga in 97, I bought a house in November of that year. That was my birthday gift to myself, buying, buying a house. And um, spent most of the winter, spring, and summer of 98 renovating the house. And even when I left the area, I liked the house. I liked the particular neighborhood that I lived in, that I am still living in. So even when I went back downstate to work, I was downstate Monday through Fridays, and then Fridays I would get in the car and drive back home. So I was here on weekends, and I did that for several years up to when I retired. And decided that I would I would stay here until I made a decision as to where exactly I wanted to live. What do you like about living here? What do you not like about living here? Um, the, the, the dynamics of that question have become fluid. Um, 
I, I probably continue to stay here. My wife is originally from Auburn, born and raised. Um, two of her children, one, one daughter is local here in Auburn. The other one is married with two of our grandchildren in Clarence Center. Um, I, I, I learned a while ago that if, if I had to live in Auburn and, and limit my cultural social activities in Auburn, I would probably left a long time ago. So I knew that if I was willing to get in the car and drive any place from an hour to two hours in any direction, I could get the type of cultural enrichment that I needed. I, I continued to like the, the house, even though it's an old house, it was built in the 1870s and there's, there's, there's always something that goes on that becomes a pain. Um, so I, I, I also like the fact that I see sky. You know, w when you're downstate because of the nature of high-rise buildings and everything else, you really don't see sky. And I remember when I first came up here, and even now, you know, at night, you see stars, you see the aura around the moon. Um, there's a different sense of space. You know, your space is expansive where your space um, downstate and where I was living is more constricted um, just by the nature of the, the, the residences that you tend to live in. Um, I, I, I do think that at its core, um, people here are, are, have a certain spirit. I, I think that's become me more difficult as people find themselves more divided and, and steeped into kind of a dogma that others may not agree with. Um, but, but you, you know, in, in, in my mind, I never, I've never seen Auburn as the, the, the place where I would permanently be. Um, at some point in my career, I, I had the opportunity to take a sabbatical, which basically then became a year sabbatical. And I went to live in Toronto and it, it, it was a different experience living in another country w w with a different set of cultural norms. And I've always said it would be kind of cool to live in one place for half of the year and live in another place the other half of the year. I just haven't decided what that should be. I've thought about completely um, moving out of the country and I've talked to people about Costa Rica, Panama, things like that, but there hasn't been any concrete effort to um to make that happen you know in, in in my life i've had the opportunity to travel around the world so i have a sense of world cultures and 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 and, and different people and how people globally see certain things differently from an american mindset um but but for now um i'm okay in terms of being here the, an interesting point is um, when I kind of settled in, because initially when I came up here, I was living in, Gen in Geneva. Um, no, not, yeah, no, I was living in Ithaca and, and was commuting from Ithaca to Auburn um, and, and, and then stopped doing that as, as winter set in and, and, and driving conditions got worse and had a good relationship with, with a few local motels in the city that enabled me to have kind of a Monday to Friday residence and the room would be held for me um, while I was downstate for the weekend and I would come back. But I, I've always said that um, I may not necessarily like Auburn, but I like where I live. Uh, and probably if, if, if I was in a different section I don't know if I would would still have been here, particularly when you get into the idea of a six to eight hour drive um, twice a week um, and the toil that 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 takes on one's spirit and one's physicality. So, so but I'm here now.
I, I, I don't know if I have a a, a, a a good sense of not liking because I'm I'm an adaptive person. So over time, things that I don't like, I've, I've found ways to adapt to it and I don't necessarily worry about it. Um, I, I was commenting to my wife this morning, I said, wow, I've gone from two two squirrels in the backyard, now there's five out here. And I remember there was a, a period a few years ago where there were so many squirrels, I had to you know, do a trap and release type of situation and, and have hired um, professional folks to, to, to trap squirrels and that whole bit. Um, I used to have almost once a year bats in the house that hasn't happened but i pretty much adapted to that i could actually capture you know the the bat myself and then you know release it as long as i knew it wasn't ray beat or anything um japanese beetles i dislike because they they destroy um roses but you know i adapt to that so i i guess what i'm saying anything that i dislike over time, I found ways to take that dislike and at least make it neutral where it doesn't bother me the way it used to bother me. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that I can just tick off a list of, you know, these are the things that I dislike or these are the things that peeve me. I mean, like last year, I, I had, um, major lilac bushes. I mean, I'm not talking about short bushes. I'm talking about big, you know, tree-like bushes that the, the city um, made me cut down because they said that it was a pedestrian and vehicular obstruction. Um, that, you know, and I, and I went through petitioning the city. I went to the, the, the historical association because, you know, we're talking about uh, an ecological system that has been in existence in this neighborhood for well over a hundred years, and that was that was easily documentable, um, but nothing could go on. So I totally disliked that. And but then what happened? I said, okay, now that I have to do that, I have to rethink, you know, certain areas of the property, and how do I create something that I could be at peace with? Well, you know, it it, it it's there. There's been some adjustments, and probably in a few years it'll be exactly the way I want it because um, I guess my personality is if there's something that bothers me, something that I dislike, okay, what's what's the pathway to, to move that at least from being negative to either being neutral or being positive? Um, you know, I can't just sit here and say, well, yeah, I dislike this, I dislike that. I, I like the relationship I have with um, small, um, business owners. Um, I like the fact that, that you can impact local government, county government, um, certain city agencies that when you live in a bigger, bigger city or um, downstate, you don't have, you're not able to do just based on the number of people in a population and the bureaucratic intricacies that, that exist. So there's that sense of being involved if you want to be, even though at times, you know, folks take certain positions that hurt the hell out of me. Again, you know, you try to figure out well, what, what's the larger issue, what's the prize you're really after, and then you figure out a strategy and go from there. How has your neighborhood changed since you moved here? When I moved here, um, there were less cars. I used to joke about that. If you were at, if, if, if you were downtown Auburn at a red light and there were two or three cars at that, at that red light, that was a traffic jam, okay? Um, that has changed as the number of cars have changed. My immediate neighborhood, um, there are parts of the neighborhood that are transitional in terms of multiple um, housing units in, in one structure. Um, so I, 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 I dislike that because I think the nature of residential communities are being um, changed 
but 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 for me, w one of the things I remember coming here, and I used to tell folks, you know, eventually you're going to start seeing deer in Auburn, and of course, folks thought, you know, that I had lost my mind. Uh, you now have deer in Auburn. I remember saying that I. I would really like to see a red fox on my property. Well, I had the opportunity to see a red fox on my property. And then the latest thing I used to say to folks, you know, black bears are coming. They're going to be here pretty soon. And, they, and everybody said, there you go again. Where do you get these outlandish ideas from? And what do we see now? There are, bear, there are black bears adjacent to Auburn and Fleming and, and some other places. So th that whole ecological sense of things have change that I think has an impact on the community. But, but, but by and large, I live in a stable community. Uh, if people move out, it's because they're going to permanently relocate to Florida or they're downsizing from a house to rent an apartment because the children are out of the house. They don't need that type of space anymore. But all in all, there's been kind of a stable consistency that, um, is good. You probably see more folks walking that that you don't know that you don't see, um, who may be recent transplants, um, who may not bring the same gentility that I was used to. In fact, the other day I was remarking one of the things I like living here is that, you know, you could pass people you didn't know, go good morning, they would go good morning to you. You know, they don't know you, you don't know them. But it's it, it was is it was that sense that I think creates neighborhood, that creates community, but that's beginning to um that's beginning to change. I, I think the 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 cultural and racial dynamics in this city is is, is changing. Um I think there are a number of institutional issues that are going through a, a, a rethinking process as to uh, who and what they serve and how they um, serve folks. But, you know, by and large, I, I always remind myself, when I came up here in 97, the, the, the motto for the tourism board was got milk, got corn. I thought that was the most hilarious thing I ever heard. I used to send people bumper stickers because they were they were bumper stickers that that said "Got milk, got corn." And I used to send it to my friends down saying, "Say, can you imagine that me of all people are living up here?" And then at some point, I started to understand the agricultural dynamics of living in a part of the state that ranks high in corn production, that ranks high in dairy production and started to understand that got milk, got corn had a deeper meaning to it. And, and folks would say, well, you know, do you like living upstate better than downstate? And my response was and still is, it, it, it's not that type of comparison. Each part offers something that's totally different, that's unique than the other part. And the issue between downstaters and upstaters is that nobody takes the time to try to understand that dynamic. So if you're downstate, anybody that lives, you know, north of the Tappan Zee Bridge is a bunch of hicks. And, and people, you know, upstate look at downstaters and, and find that they're arrogant. Well, the thing is that nobody has really taken the time to understand that there are different dynamics that go on so that if if you live in a place like Cuyahoga County, you live it, you know, in the Finger Lakes region, you understand that how people do things, how they think are basic to the environment in which they live in. And it doesn't make it better or worse. It just makes it different. No. What sort of significant world events have you lived through? Obviously the pandemic being one of them. And you mentioned the civil rights in the sixties, things like that. In terms of world events, I've been fascinated with what's going on in Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis mainland China. Um, I had the opportunity to spend time in Hong Kong on, on, on both sides. Uh, Hong Kong is basically 
two areas separated by a waterway. Um, and it's always had this kind of independent um, capitalistic way of thinking. And I was there the year prior to when mainland China was going to kind of re-embrace Hong Kong and bring it into um, their form of government. So I, I, I find that very intriguing and interesting. And Aduna, we've published some, some writers from Hong Kong. So, you know, I tend to follow that. I mean, I've been to Thailand, so I tend to follow kind of the political intrigue that goes on in, in, in that country. So places that I've been, I tend to, to see the world in terms of the dynamics that are going on currently and try to make some sense of that based on my firsthand observations when I was there. Um, in country, the, the, the current political divide continues to, you know, intrigue me. You know, I, I joke about that I need to um, detox from cable news programs because uh, it seems that th that's the only thing that, I, that I'm watching if the television is on. Um, those political dynamics are intriguing to me and how as a country prepares for a presidential election that we're, we're falling back into behaviors that do not necessarily reflect the mood of the country. And then maybe again, um, it, it, it does. So I, I, I think nowadays, most people, it is hard to divorce your localized living and lifestyle um, because so much of that is influenced by kind of a national ambiance and nuances and in certain cases kind of you know global things so that you know maybe in, in, in my younger days that the world was a lot bigger um, now with technology with the ways we communicate, that world has, has, has shrunk. And so I can talk to a colleague in Pakistan who's well aware of social justice issues, you know, in New York um, and, and in the United States in general. So you, what, what has happened is that the world community has in a sense shrunk down where whatever's going on in the world does have in one way or another an impact on, on, on your life, even though you may not easily recognize it. Well, thank you very much for being a part of this project. I have enjoyed the time getting to know you and this time getting to know more about you.